No. No. You cannot see the board oh, because I haven't. Just started recording. Recording started. To just share it. Share it. No, can you see? Can you check the board? Can you see the board yes, now? Sir. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So, uh, what about the light? Is it all right? Or should I switch off some lights? No. No, because there's no light on the board. This is fine, ma'am. It's fine? Okay, fine. Okay, then. So, let me start. All right. So, so far, we've been studying about partition tensors. So essentially, I define these objects which have uh, some number of components and how they transform under so we or under ground rotation. So essentially, what we did was we said that we have chosen three-dimensional space, condition uh, basis of this three-dimensional space, and then we considered rotation transformations, and then we considered objects which have say three to the power of m components, and if they transform in some particular way under this rotation transformations, then in that case, we said that these are tensors. And then using these tensors, we did study a little bit of tensor algebra, tensor analysis, and how this can be used in vector calculus, and also some physical applications. But if you look at the kind of transformations I've used so far, so what we did was we started with the Cartesian basis for the coordinate system. So this is my x, y, z axis. So let's say that these are my unit vectors, the i cap, g cap, and k cap, x, y, z directions. And then we said that I can rotate this, or we consider linear orthogonal transformations made to new coordinate systems or coordinate axes. And then we asked about given certain kinds of certain objects, how they transform under this transformations. But here, if I consider these transformations, so I had this E1, E2, E3, which was my basis. So like the, this one, I cap, J cap, A cap, for example. And then I went to another basis, E prime, which was E1 prime, E2 prime, E3 prime, by a transformation, which is we always chose this to be linear transformations, firstly, and in particular, we took the linear orthogonal transformations. But now imagine that I have a transformation of this kind, in which we have also studied, and many people are familiar with this. So, in the Cartesian thing, suppose I have the co coordinates as x, y, z, I choose this, and let's say I have a position, I have a point P, and uh -huh. So this is I'm going to do a rotation this point. And let's say the components of this are x, y, z. Now suppose I go from this Cartesian basis, so I go to say spherical coordinates. So I go from Cartesian coordinates. You know the transformations, so x will be equal to, for example, r sine theta cos phi, then the y will be equal to r sine theta sine phi, z will be equal to r cos. So I've gone from this description, this here, to another description, which is in this form, where if I have the point P, now it's defined, it's represented by R theta phi, and where this is your R vector, this is my theta, with this angle which is making the z-axis. And 
phi is the so this is the polar angle and this is the azimuth. Okay. So R is nothing but modal. So I write this here. You have very often used instead of Cartesian coordinates, you have often used this kind of spherical polar coordinates. Now, is this transformation from the Cartesian coordinate system to a spherical polar coordinate system a linear transformation? So you have explicitly the transformation, for example. So you can think of this I'm going from say from the spherical polar coordinates to Cartesian. So I the way I have written it, it's like R theta phi two. So from spherical polar coordinates, I'm going to a Cartesian coordinate system. Is this a linear transformation? So if you look at this, are these I mean this set of transformation laws, are these linear? You can see from here also now I have r equal to root of x square plus y square plus z square. Is this linear? A linear dependence? No. Now it's very clear that it's not a linear dependence at all. So when I go from the spherical coordinates or spherical polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates, these transformation laws are certainly not linear. It's very obvious from here or even from here. Okay, so these are not linear transformations. So essentially, what this says is that. Now I can ask the same question now. What happens? See, I have defined now objects which were having some specified transformation laws under linear orthogonal transformations, given a particular Cartesian coordinate basis. And then if I go make a linear orthogonal transformation to another basis, then how this particular objects of these tensors, we define how they transform. But I can ask now, what happens to these objects when I make such kind of transformations which are not linear? Okay. So one, so one first thing you can see is that when I make such a kind of a non, I mean such a kind of a transformation which is not linear, you can see that there is a difference between a Cartesian basis. So when I go from here to here by location transformation, so when I went from here to here, or what do we understand when we say that we have a Cartesian basis? Okay, what is the difference? Let me put it like this. What is the difference between the spherical polar coordinates description of this position of this point vis a vis the Cartesian basis description of that position? The number of uh, coordinates which you require are still the same because I'm still describing three dimensional space, I require three coordinates. So here I have XYZ in the Cartesian system. And in the spherical polar coordinate system, I have R theta phi. Okay. But also, I can also find out what are these. So we can also write it in the following way. Now, let me write it like this. So I can write, for example, that R should be. So most generally, I can write by start with the Cartesian coordinate system. It's x plus y j, y j cap plus z times k. Which I can write as equal to from here. See, I have r sine theta cos phi. It's, sorry, I can plus r sine theta sine phi. G plus r cos theta. Okay. Now, if you look at so if I this point, I can write also see that this I can write it in terms of r times r here. 
when R cap is unit vector along. So if I'm at this particular point, I will get, see, because corresponding to this R theta phi, I will get three unit vectors. Let me call it as R cap theta cap. For the minute, let me just call it like this, theta cap and phi cap. I'll give a different description right now, later. So I'll get something which is like R cap, which is like along this direction, because it's along the direction R. Then I'm going to get a theta cap and a phi cap, which we will find out what is theta cap phi cap in just a little while. So I will get here. So the same point P can be described as okay. So this case R will be simply R R cap, but I will get three basis vectors in the spherical polar coordinates corresponding to the unit vectors along R cap, theta cap, and phi cap. Three mutually orthogonal directions. We can write down what is theta cap, i cap, phi cap, and in terms of i cap, j cap, and k cap, in just a little while. I'll do that in just a little while. Now, suppose I have another point, and r cap is going to point along the r direction. Now, suppose I have another point here. Let's say I have this point q, q here. In this case, what will be the r cap direction? Will it be in the same direction as here? Here you can see R cap is pointing like this. Now, if you see here for this, you will see your R cap will be pointing along this direction. Say this is say R2. So your R2 cap or R cap here will be along this direction. So in other words, what you can see is now you will get the basis. Again, I can construct a basis. So what you can see is that my basis of vectors will depend upon where I am or, or the position. So if, whether it is at P or whether it is at Q, I will get different orthogonal basis. Because you can see, it's very clear, you can see from R cap itself that it's going to have a different direction depending on whether you are at P. So if I'm at the point P, I'm going to get the R cap along this direction. On the other hand, if I'm at point Q, this is going to be this. On the other hand, if I looked at my Cartesian coordinate system, so here I will get still I, so it's still going to be I cap, J cap, K cap. If I'm at Q, again it will be the same. So your basis doesn't, or your basis vectors do not depend upon the location of the point, or they do not depend upon the position. So that is actually the main difference between this the Cartesian coordinate system and this system, for example, your spherical polar coordinate system, that your basis vectors will depend upon the position or where you are in the space. Okay. And this really is an example of a non-Cartesian system or a non-Cartesian coordinate system. Another example which all of you are familiar with is the cylindrical polar coordinates. So I will also consider that. So these two are something which you are really familiar. So this is spherical polar coordinates. And then if I have cylindrical polar coordinates, then of course you look at the from the cylindrical geometry. In that case, I will choose my system like this. So I have x, y, z. And now if I have a position P, so I have R. So in Cartesian basis, it's still X, Y, Z, the components. But according to your cylindrical polar coordinates, you will have a rho and then you will have a phi and Z. Okay. What is rho? So if I have this point P, then this is your rho and this is phi. So, the so cylindrical polar coordinates transformation is this, that's z equal to z, then x will be equal to rho cos phi, and y will be equal to rho cos So, these are the transformations. So, this rho is the projection of this on the x, y plane, and then you have rho cos phi giving you x and rho sine phi giving you y. And now you can see my r square will be equal to 
rho squared plus z or r will be equal to root of rho squared plus z. So again, this is an example of a non-Cartesian problem system. Because again, what you can see is that, so here you can see that my rho is going to be, if I look at the unit vector of this, it's going to be like this, then my phi will be, okay, so from here you can see the phi will be some, or, okay, so I have a rho and my z is still going to be like this. This is my rho and then the phi will be like this. I'll give a different notation for this. So again, what you can see is that, I mean, it's very clear that suppose it's right here and now at this point, so even if I keep, so you think about a cylinder and if I'm keeping the same r so that the rho remains the same, but your phi direction will change because in this case, the phi is along this part and then once you go here to the point here, the phi will come like this. So again, it will depend upon, your basis vectors will depend upon the position where you're located in the space. And of course, you know what these kind of coordinates are called. These are also known as curvy linear coordinates. So most generally, these are known as curvy linear coordinates. So R theta, phi. So these are examples of curvy linear coordinate systems. So let me now do a little. Let's see a little bit more about this. So what we want to ask is now I can ask the question for you that suppose I have an object, say a vector, okay? So I have a vector which, we, uh, so, so I will say I have chosen this Cartesian coordinate system and I have a vector. And the vector I've defined it, how it depends upon its transformations and the rotation transformations. So if I have a vector here, then I would have three components. So let's say I have some arbitrary vector here. And I know that it's going to have a1, a2, a3 components. This is in the Cartesian system. Now I can ask that when I make, for example, if I go from this Cartesian basis to this cylindrical polar coordinate system, then how will these components change? Because now I can't use my laws which I've used earlier because those were those those laws were only meant for linear orthogonal transformations. Whereas this is very clear even from here that these are not, this is certainly not a linear transformation. But I would like to ask how these quantities transfer. You can figure out the properties of such objects. And even, so here I only talked about vectors, but we also talked about higher rank tensors. So I would like to do that. Okay, so now the first thing to note is let me consider with this. And another thing I should mention, so let me just take the example with cylindrical polar coordinates, afterwards we will prove it. So cylindrical polar coordinates is an example, a simple example of a curvy linear coordinates or non-partition coordinate system. And I should also mention, the, so if you look at these values, so I have rho, phi and z. And you also know that rho can be because C rho is equal to root of rho is equal to x square plus y square square root. So therefore you will see that rho will be always greater than or equal to zero. The range of rho is from zero to infinity. Phi will go because it's an angle, so you can restrict yourself from zero. So it's an angle which is making with the x-axis. So I can take it from zero to two. So and 2 pi again will be the same as 0. So therefore, I only put a less than sign. See, because if I make a full 2 pi rotation, I'll come back to the same point. So it's 0 less than pi, less than pi. And z, of course, is the height. So I'm having cylindrical geometry. So it's going from minus infinity to plus. Okay. So your position vector then, so the position vector now in terms of rho, phi and z can be written as, so r I can write now here as equal to rho cos phi, I can rho sine phi, I can plus z, 
This is my question. And now, as I said, if I want to find out what are the basis vectors uh, along the row direction, in, I'm now taking the cylindrical coordinates. So if I, if I want to find out the basis vectors along the row direction, along the y, and sorry, along the pi and along the z, in the Cartesian basis, we already know it's i cap, j cap, and k cap. It's just this. But if I here I want to find out what is the basis, then I can define it like this. Because this is what is going to give me the vector which is going to be in the increasing direction of row. They'll, because if you look at, we, we'll see this a little bit more explicitly again, because it's going to give me the direction in which row increases. Because you know that the r, if I want to take, so in increasing will be del r by del rho into d. So this should be the direction of the increasing row. And this, if I look from here, it's going to give me minus rho sine pi. I can means row constant. So if I take the derivative of this with respect to this, so I'm simply going to get cos phi I can. So if you look at the row vector, the row vector, or the, so this vector E rho, if I define it like this, now you can see that E rho is going to lie in my xy plane. So I just put the xy so that you can understand what's happening. See, this is my pi, and the row is along this, okay? That's how we define the row. And if you look at cos phi, so let's see what, so this is my pi. Now you have cos phi i cap. So cos phi i cap means, so I have this unit vector, so I just take a unit vector along this. So this is the one, and this is phi. So this is cos phi, and this will be sine phi. Okay? So this is my e rho vector. And that is exactly what I would expect. So this should be your rho vector or what I was calling as the vector, because your rho vector should lie along rho, okay? And since I'm defining E rho to be along this, so it is, okay, just so, so this is your E rho, but, and in this case, we turn out that your E rho is nothing but a unit vector, because you can see that this particular vector will have a unit okay? So this is cos phi, this is sine phi, so it's basically, okay, the best way to think about it is like this, that I have a cylinder, my row is in the xy plane. And I mean, anything, you can just take parallel planes to the xy plane and row along that will give you the, uh, along the radial direction in the xy plane will give you the a row. And you can also see that this is increasing in the direction of row from here, okay? So what I was calling as rho cap is essentially along this, and that now I'm giving a name, different name. I'm calling it as e. Similarly, you can see that your e phi by definition will be nothing but del r by del phi. Okay. So this is where my phi is increasing. So it should be like this again. It should lie in the xy plane. You can imagine what it should be. I, it should lie in the in, um, xy plane, and it should be now something which is orthogonal to this because it should be like this because this is the direction in which your phi is increasing. And from here, you can see that this is going to become equal to minus rho sine phi, I can plus rho cos phi. So as promised, this is a vector which lies in the xy plane. And you can also see that if I take the dot product of e rho with e phi, it's going to be zero. I think. So it is orthogonal to your e rho vector. So therefore, given this, maybe I should draw this figure again. So if I put it again in the xy plane, so I'm only plotting the xy plane here. So if I have xy plane, then this is your e rho. This is phi. And so if this is my e rho, so at this point, you can say that this is my e rho, and this will be my 
at this particular point. Yes. And one thing more, you can see that A rho is a unit vector. On the other hand, this quantity is not a unit vector. Because if you look at the magnitude of this, I'm going to get this as okay. So that is first thing to observe that there's a difference. And one more thing you can see is that suppose instead of having this here, I was having a point here. Suppose my point was here. Or that means instead of having five here, I have five here. Then you can see that rho will be like this. Now five will be like this. So your E rho and E five will depend upon where you are located. So again, as I said, that's the signature of a non partition system. Similarly, you can also find out what is EZ. And EZ by definition will be del R by del Z. And again, this is going to give me the direction in which they will increase, and that's something that we are going to do. This is something which we are very familiar with because Z will increase along the Z axis. Okay. And if I did the same thing in the Cartesian basis, suppose I simply wrote it as X times I cap plus Y times J cap plus Z times A cap, then you will find that EX will be simply I cap, EY will be K cap, and EZ will be K cap. And that's how it should be because this particular quantity. Like for example, here del r by del rho will tell you the increasing the vector which is along which rho increases. This will give you the vector along which phi increases, and this will give you the vector along which z increases. Okay. But the thing to notice now is that these vectors, unlike so if I used instead of this a Cartesian description for my r. So if I wrote the same point here using a Cartesian description, then my del r by del x will be simply equal to i n. And del r by del y will be j cap. And del r by del z will be equal to j cap. And what you can see is that these vectors, i cap, j cap, K cap are all three unit vectors, and further you can see that this doesn't depend on I mean, what basis I get for del r by del or what I get del r by del x, del r by del y, and del r by del z. What I get for them doesn't depend upon where I am in the position. So, whether I'm at P or whether I'm at Q, I'll get the same i j. Okay. On the other hand, what you will find is that here del r by del rho, del r by del phi, and del r by del z will depend upon where you are because these values will change. See, I have cos phi i cap plus sin phi j cap. So this values here, cos phi and sine phi, will depend upon the value of phi. Okay. And another thing, another difference is that here, all these are unit vectors. On the other hand, here you can see that why in this particular case, you can see this is unit vector, this is unit vector, but this is certainly not a unit vector. Okay. Now again, let me go back to the Cartesian system for a minute. Or this is a, it's the same point. Like, whether we are Cartesian basis or whether we are non-Cartesian basis, the space is the same. It is just I'm describing it in two different ways. Now let me do one thing. So let's again go back to this point P. So let's say I have this point P, which is represented by R, and which I can have either a Cartesian basis description or a coordinate cylinder, cylindrical polar coordinate system. Now let's say that I go to some other point very close to this. I displace this point from P to some Q minimally. So this is R plus D R. And by an infinitesimal displacement. So this vector is my D R. So by definition, what is D R? I made an infinitesimal displacement. So what should it be? Okay, let's let's do it in both uh, this thing. In the Cartesian basis. Suppose I have a Cartesian basis. Because this is R plus dr, so this point is so this point P is going to be described by R, and this part is going to be described by R plus dr. So I'm simply going to get dx dy dz times i k cap j cap k cap for dr. Right? So in Cartesian basis, my dr is simply going to be equal to dx times i cap plus dy times j cap plus dz times. This is in Cartesian. But if I now use my cylindrical polar coordinates, what is this? In 
how does the displacement look like? The infinitesimal displacement, how would it write? How would it write? By definition from here, I should simply now expect this to be del r by because I'm taking an infinitesimal displacement, right? So I should get d rho plus del r by del phi times d phi by definition. That's all. Del r by del z into dz. By definition, this should be the infinitesimal displacement. And what is this? This is nothing but del r by del rho. That's why I said that this is nothing but e r times d phi. Sorry, d rho plus e rho times d phi plus e z times this. So therefore, what you find is that so if I write d rho. So what you will find is that your dr is nothing but now if I substitute for this prs, so you can see that I got here dr is nothing but er times d rho plus. So I can write it most generally as d rho times er plus d phi times e phi plus d z times where I define both of them e z e phi e phi and Using this description, what I know for the uh, e rho, e phi, and this, what I will get back is, and you just see this, because e rho is this, cos phi plus sine is this thing, so I can write this as equal to. So let me just write down the answer. Okay, so I, you can see here. I collect all the i cap terms because here in this dr cap I have this cos phi, so I will get a d rho times cos phi, and from e phi again I will get an i cap term here. So I'll get minus of d phi into sine phi into i cap okay, from the first term. Then I'm going to get plus from here a d rho times sine phi plus from here. A row cos phi, not as a row of seven. Row cos phi, d phi, which is that. Plus, from here I'm going to get something, so it's times. And you can also see from the definitions of x and y, this is nothing but your dr. Because dr dx, so the first term is nothing but dx. Because x is equal to rho cos phi. So if I take dx and I write it in terms of this rho and phi, I get this. Similarly, this is dy and this is dx. Now I can also ask next that what is the magnitude of this displacement? So I have made this infinitesimal displacement. And magnitude of this, what is the magnitude? So if I define my magnitude square actually as equal to dr dot dr, in Cartesian coordinates, this simply is going to be dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. So if this is x, x, y, z, this is x plus y, z, so you simply get that q, uh, the distance. This is the distance. And this is in your polar coordinates. Now you can see that from here. I'm going to get, I write it like this d rho e rho plus d phi e phi plus g z e z dotted with itself d rho e rho plus d phi e phi plus d z e z. And this is going to give me d rho square. And from here, you can see that what I'm going to get is rho square d phi square 
plus d z square. So if I look at it, look at my Cartesian coordinate, the infinitesimal magnitude of the infinitesimal displacement, then what I find, find is that if I look at it in Cartesian system, it's simply dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. So ds is going to be simply equal to root of this. On the other hand, if I do this in the cylindrical polar coordinates, what I'm going to get is d rho squared plus rho squared d phi rho squared plus d z squared. Now imagine that in your Cartesian coordinate basis, I have made the displacement. So I have, for example, this point. Imagine that I have put this point. So let's say I have this. So this is dr. Okay, so I have this point here, and let us say that this is x, y, z. And imagine now that I'm only going to change the z direction. I don't change. So I'm going to shift this point. So the infinitesimal displacement I'm doing only along the z direction. So what will happen? I go from here to here. So to this q, which is now x, y is remaining the same, but z has become z plus dz. Now what will be the dis distance here from this point? From what is the distance between the points p and q in this Cartesian basis? According to the Cartesian basis. Or what is the magnitude of the displacement now, the infinitesimal displacement? So if I'm just making the displacement along the z direction, what will be the dis what will be the answer uh, for the magnitude of your displacement according to the Cartesian basis? Just dz. Yeah, it is just dz. Very good. Similarly, you can see that if I displace along the x-axis, I'm going to get the displacement or magnitude of the displacement to be dx. If I displace along the y-axis, I'm going to get the displacement to be simply dy, the magnitude center. Now consider that I have a, the description of this in the cylindrical polar coordinates. Okay. So I've gone from this point P, x, y, z, or if I go from rho, phi, z, and now I go to another point, Q, where I'm going to rho phi plus d phi z. I've not done anything to the rho, but I just changed my phi. That means the angle I've changed from phi to phi plus d phi. So it's now here in the xy plane, the angle has changed. What will be the magnitude of the displacement now in this case? From here, can you see what will be the magnitude of the displacement? You have got an expression for the, mag for the magnitude of the displacement written in the cylindrical polar coordinates here. I have this expression. So from that, can you see and tell me that if I change the phi, see I'm just changing the location. So you imagine that you're on a cylinder and you're at the same radius, but I've just gone along the circumference I just moved the point along the circumference by a small angle, d5. So, now, pardon? Yeah, the answer will be that I'm going to get a ds. So, if I change phi to phi plus d5, keeping rho fixed, okay? Keeping rho and z fixed. I'm going to get ds is equal to rho times d5. I'm not getting, so it's very unlike this Cartesian system. See, for the Cartesian system, what happened if I displaced along x axis, I got dx as the displacement magnitude. If I did along the y axis, I got dy. And if I did along the z axis, I got dz. On the other hand, now here, if I do along the phi direction, I'm not going to get simply d phi, but it is going to be rho times d phi. So it's really getting multiplied by some factor, which is a coordinate which is not dependent on phi. So this is something which you can see. 
Similarly, now if I ask, what is your volume element? So suppose I take in the cylindrical polar coordinates now a volume element. First of all, I can just take the volume element. So let's say that this is So I have this infinitesimal volume element. If I take this infinitesimal volume element in Cartesian coordinates, what will be TV? So it's like you've gone from x to so you've gone from x to x plus dx, y to y plus t1, and z to z plus tz. So what will be the infinitesimal volume element? Rho d phi dz. No, in, I'm asking in Cartesian system. Cartesian, in Cartesian coordinates, if I just take, how will you write down the infinitesimal volume element? Dx dy dz. Simply dx dy dz, because you are going to take it simply from like a cube, right? Okay, now if I do the same thing in my cylindrical polar coordinates, what will this answer be? Rho, rho d rho d phi dz. Yes. So I'll write this in the following way. I'll write this as d rho, then I have a rho d phi, and then I have a dz. So because this is actually in terms of the infinitesimal displacements, so if you, you can see from here, if I did a displacement along the rho direction, I'm simply going to get d rho from here. If I did along the z, z direction, I still get dz. But if I did along phi, then I'm going to get a rho d phi. So it's the infinitesimal displacement along rho times this rho d5 times dz. Okay, which you can write as rho d rho. That way, but I will put it like this. So again, what you can see is that when I go from this Cartesian to your cylindrical polar coordinates, the volume element is not simply d rho d5 dz, but it's getting multiplied by this rho. Similarly, you can see that here, for example, your infinitesimal displacement, keeping two of the coordinates fixed. Is not simply d5 and actually increasing along the direction phi, but it's not simply d5, but it's getting multiplied by this factor rho. So, on the other hand, you can see that when I do for the, so if I keep, um, if I keep uh, rho phi and z fixed, my ds is simply going to be equal to d rho. And for the other case, uh, if I keep keeping a row and five fixed, I will get ds is equal to simply dz. Right? So what you can see is that my displacement only for the case in this particular case, only when the phi is changing, I'm getting multiplied. It's getting multiplied by this factor rho. For d rho for rho and z, it doesn't get multiplied. And that factor is also showing up here. Now, in the same way, you can see that if I do the same thing for, say, spherical polar coordinates, you will find that the volume element, what is the volume element in spherical polar coordinates? I've written down the spherical polar coordinates a little earlier. So, if I have this spherical polar coordinates, r theta phi, what is the volume element dv in this? Anybody, what, what? I'm sure you people have encountered volume elements and spherical polar coordinates. You've done class, you will have done class ED1, right? And also quantum mechanics one or also MSD. I'm asking yeah. R square dr sin theta d theta d5. So I will write that as dr, then I will write this as r d theta. Then I will write this as R sin theta. So, you have told us R square sin theta, dr, d theta, d. Okay. 
okay, but I'll write it like this. So again, here it's unlike the Cartesian coordinate system because I'm not going to get simply dr, d beta, d phi. So the coordinates are actually r theta phi, but I'm not getting simply r dr, d beta, d phi. I'm getting these factors, extra factors. Okay. And such factors are actually what are known as again here you will find that if I keep, for example, if I keep theta phi fixed, then you will find the displacement as dr. If I keep r and phi fixed, and if you ask what is the displacement along the theta direction, then you will find that it's r d theta. That you can understand because theta is this angle, so I just get an r d theta. And if I keep r theta fixed, change phi, then I'm going to get an r sine theta d phi. This is exactly like the last one because this will be lying in the x y plane. So what we will see is that your displacements. If I look at the displacements along your coordinates, that is in this case rho theta phi. They are not simply the infinitesimal displacements are not simply equal to the infinitesimal dis, uh, differences between the coordinates itself, but they are multiplied by these factors. So most generally, what one can do is when we have such non-Cartesian coordinates, I can write my ts. So I'm keeping two of the coordinate system fixed. So I'll say now I'm going to do now non-Cartesian systems. I'm going to describe it in a little bit more general way. So again, I'm keeping to my or I'll call them as curvy linear coordinates, most generally. Again, we are in three-dimensional space. So most generally, let's say that I call them as U1, U2, U3. Okay. So if you have cylindrical polar coordinates, this is like R theta, or oh, sorry, R, I'm sorry, rho phi z. If you are in spherical polar coordinates, it's R theta phi. And we can have other kinds of directions also. And most generally, then my displacement. So if I keep now two of them fixed, u2 and u3, for example, fixed, I won't get just du1. Most generally, I can get uh, h1, I will call this as du1, for example. Okay, and I can write this as so if I keep like u du2 equal to du3 equal to zero. So and this is h1, I will say, can get as h2, du2, du1, du3, So these are called as gauge factors, h1, h2, h3. So for example, when I take the cylindrical polar coordinates, my h, so my, for cylindrical polar coordinates, your u1 is rho, u2 is phi and u3 is z and you can see that your h1 is 1 or h1 equal to h rho equal to 1 and h2 equal to h5 equal to now rho and h3 equal to h z equal to 1. So you can also see that what the scale factor for this here for the for the phi is not simply a function of phi but it's actually a function of rho and it simply becomes rho. Okay. So most generally, these scale factors h1, h2, h3 will be a function of so u1, u2, u3. And if you now look at your volume element, that is simply going to become h1, h2. Okay, I will continue with this. It will become h1, h2, h3 times du1, du2, du3. All right, I'll stop here. We'll continue with this tomorrow. We started very late today because there, there was some problem. This uh, the connection was not there. I don't know why. Ah, good so that silage was there, and then it said that network connection is not there. So how do I stop the recording? It's the setting Already up and stop. No, I did not stop. Oh, you have to stop okay. okay? Mm. Recording me okay. See, that's what's what's the problem watch. Is gone. I didn't do anything at all. Mm. It, it recording mm. me okay. Ma'am, should we stop from our end?
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. stop it from there. Yeah, you, you, you stop it from there. 